Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for our Woo You CE event. Tonight, we get to hear from Dr. Michael Shiglazian on glaucoma and ocular surface disease. So I'll be your host tonight, Dr. Arielle Serenzi. So I'd like to introduce our amazing speaker tonight. So Dr. Shiglazian is a associate professor at ICO and chief of staff of the Illinois Eye Institute. He is a graduate of State University of New York College of Optometry and completed a residency in primary eye care and ocular disease at the Pennsylvania College of Optometry. He is a founding member and immediate past president and currently the executive vice president of the Glo Optometric Glaucoma Society. And his practice is focused exclusively on patients with glaucoma and related conditions while co-managing surgical care as well. So we are so excited to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Ariel. Um, welcome, everyone. Here are my disclosures. Um, some of them are relevant. I'll be talking about uh, glaucoma products and dry eye products in our talk this evening. Uh, so glaucoma and dry eye, uh, for those of you who don't really know, uh, all that I do at ICO is see patients with glaucoma. And of course, a lot of those patients have dry eye. Uh, this is a lecture I've done uh, many times over the past 10 years or so, and it's always uh, so exciting for me and so uh, I think informative to get up to date with new products uh, and new approaches to a problem that just will not go away. And that is the coexistence of these two uh, ocular conditions in the patients that we see every day. So it's something I'm very passionate about. I hope it's something that you're very uh, excited and, and passionate about as well, trying to take care of your patients. Uh, all of us have different practices, uh, some leaning more to just the dry eye side, some leaning more to the medical and, and glaucoma side, but the intersection there is where we all really need to come together to help our patients. And I think I'll be able to share with you a number of um, important tips and tricks uh, this evening so that you can help your patients be aware of new products and how to approach uh, glaucoma disease and IOP lowering in patients who are on glaucoma medications and understand a little bit about the science behind ocular surface disease and the impact of glaucoma medications on our patients with dry eye. So when I started this uh, a decade or so ago in really examining the uh, relationship between ocular surface disease and glaucoma, I really spent most of my career, even at that time, uh, just on glaucoma. And as I got to learn more and more about ocular surface disease and dry eye, it it dawned on me that there's really a lot of similarity between these two conditions. I apologize for skipping back there. Uh, one is that they are both a chronic disease that increases with age. Uh, the definition, definitions of the disease vary. They change with time. You know, dry eye and surface disease has evolved. Even the definition of glaucoma has undergone some evolution and uh, there's still aspects of the disease that we don't fully understand. Um, a lot of mismatch between what we see on the patient and what the patients are complaining about. Sometimes it's a lot of symptoms and no signs, and sometimes it's just the opposite. So very much, you know, both the diseases go back and forth on that. I think both uh, diseases, uh, we can say for certain, affect the quality of life uh, for our patients in, in many ways. And we'll be talking more about that tonight and being aware about that so that we intervene and, and help our patients um, improve their quality of life and make sure that our treatment for uh, even a blinding eye disease does not adversely impact their quality of life. Um, along with signs and symptoms being variable and not matching, the diagnostic tests are variable. They're not always repeatable. They're sometimes inconclusive. Um, you know, it's just sometimes you have to go with uh, the constellation of all the findings and whether it's dry eye or, or glaucoma disease, sort of, you know, go based on risk factors and appearance and, and try to uh, identify the most likely uh, underlying condition. Uh, and then when you talk about treatment regimens, they're variable. They're not often fully or solely effective. We have to combine products and different approaches. Uh, you know, of course, uh, we, the dry eye approach uh, uh, for treating disease is just, you know, it's a whole a huge area of, uh, of research and interest and just with a number of products uh, that are um, available for our patients and for ourselves. And the same thing on the glaucoma side. There's always new treatments and new options, um, and we're always trying to get better at it. And then finally, I think we all realize that 
many of our patients, uh, certainly the majority, maybe not all of them, but uh, a significant percentage are non-compliant with their dry eye therapy and or their ocular surface disease therapy. So that's a challenge for us. Um, the relationship here is to understand that glaucoma medications are often contributing to ocular surface disease. Uh, many of our patients may have underlying uh, ocular surface disease and dry eye already. It gets exacerbated by the glaucoma medications or other patients may be completely asymptomatic. And once they start taking daily topical therapy uh, with uh, agents in it that can cause ocular surface disease, that's when they really become more symptomatic. And that symptomatology uh, with, uh, with dry eye can contribute to their not being compliant and uh, adhering to their glaucoma treatment and therapy. So there's a lot of back and forth here, um, an overlap between these two, con two conditions as I've uh, suggested already. So a highlight here, one of the best article titles ever, I think, is Preservatives in Eye Drops, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. And um, you know we know that preservatives in eye drops are basically the ugly side of what we do to our patients when we're treating them with glaucoma medications. There is some good in there, of course, because preservatives are necessary to maintain um, uh, uh, antimicrobial environment and prevent bad bugs from getting into our multi-dose bottles that are used over weeks or sometimes months for, uh, for our patients. And then somewhere in the middle is, you know, the bad side of multiple drops uh, increasing our patient's signs and symptoms and things like that. So uh, this article from 2010 just sort of says it all in, in uh, preservative medications and eye drops. And as we'll come to see, particularly in glaucoma medications, it's really something we need to be concerned about. Uh, also about 10 years ago in the Ocular Surface Journal, uh, there were a series of articles, and this was not the start of uh, dry eye and glaucoma, uh, but it is sort of the uh, day of reckoning, if you will. And from a couple years earlier, there had been some prevalent studies, and we'll, we'll get into those, showing just the vast number of patients and high percentage of patients who have glaucoma disease being treated with topical medications and are being adversely affected by the benzoclonium chloride or BAK that is in that medication. So articles like this really started to um, increase the awareness and hopefully motivate and stimulate both practitioners as well as those in industry in, in the development of glaucoma medications to try and do a better job and identify that long-term chronic therapy with, uh, with BAK-containing medications is not so great for our uh, patients overall. So that's one of the articles that really uh, brought this to light. And uh, we'll look at uh, more, uh, mark, uh, more information and prevalence data in a little bit. Uh, the other thing that I think everyone is aware of is the increasing number of glaucoma patients. Uh, while it's certainly not a pandemic, uh, doubling of the number of patients in the United States with glaucoma between 2010 and 2050 is going to put a huge burden on all eye care practitioners. So uh, even by 2030, when we get up to about 4 million individuals with glaucoma, uh, these patients uh, need to be managed, uh, I think, a lot by optometry. We are very well suited for doing this. We're well suited for taking care of the glaucoma disease, uh, treating them with medications, and also being aware of their dry eye and ocular surface disease and conditions so that we can uh, take care of our, our patient as a whole and not just look at uh, the disease entity, but also be aware of how they are um, impacted in terms of their quality of life with the medications that we do. So that's you know, the impending you know, uh, tidal wave, if you will, tsunami of uh, what I want optometry to be well prepared at. And I think the intersection of dry eye and glaucoma is perfect for us. Um, the other thing here, this is a, an article from a few years ago in the Journal of Glaucoma. Uh, it's sort of a standalone article. I, I don't know that this, uh, this uh, uh, research has been uh, confirmed in similar publications, but in this uh, 
a study, they looked at patients with ocular surface disease being treated with glaucoma who were not doing very well and they were intolerant to their topical treatments because of ocular surface disease. They changed up their therapy. Uh, they did a lot of the things that we're going to talk about in the lecture tonight in terms of uh, getting them away from preservatives and uh, being better selective with their ocular surface disease treatment. And they were able to make a significant impact in improved IOP lowering up to eight millimeters. Now, again, I think, you know, in a small N a case report of 10 patients, uh, you could find a lot of things that might not be replicated on a much larger uh, uh, clinical trial and study. But uh, the, uh, the point here is that we can do things to help improve our patient's glaucoma treatment just by treating their ocular surface disease. And that's one of the overriding reasons why I think this lecture is so important. Uh, let's, uh, again, take a look at what the prevalence uh, tells us so that we have this understanding about why there should be a lot of interest on industry's part, on the, the folks who make our glaucoma medications, on the folks who make the uh, artificial tears and all the other treatments for ocular surface disease. It's because 60% or more uh, of patients with glaucoma have ocular surface disease. And uh, this is one of the landmark studies that was published in Journal of Glaucoma in 2008. Um, in this study that was published in Cornea in 2010, uh, a much larger study of about 630 patients uh, broken down uh, using the OSDI uh, survey, about 50% of patients had either mild, moderate, or severe stage of uh, glaucoma. So, you know, at least half of the patients, that's certainly reflective of the glaucoma patients in my practice, probably higher for me. And it's something that uh, unfortunately with glaucoma disease, it's sometimes the OSD is overlooked and uh, the point here is to make sure that we all are aware of this and we spend extra time, probably in my practice management uh, scenario, typically a separate visit. It's really difficult for me sometimes to fully address glaucoma and fully address ocular surface disease. I maybe on a follow-up, you know, after several visits, but each of those deserve, deserves their own individual visits with the appropriate medical evaluation and discussion of treatment options. Uh, the slide here from the same study in 2010 identified that increasing number of glaucoma medications uh, adversely affected the OSDI score. And so that, uh, again, was sort of reaffirming to information that had already been identified a number of years earlier, and that is that the BAK that we spoke of earlier has um, a, a deleterious effect on cellular viability. Uh, and the epithelial cells in the cornea um, uh, their viability is decreased as the BAK concentration is increased. And we're going to come back and take a little bit further look at the science that goes on here so that we understand uh, what, uh, what the real impact is and how we can strategize to better select medications and products for our patients who are being treated for glaucoma and also uh, make a careful look and uh, thoughtful decision about what we're choosing for dry eye therapy and artificial tears. So ocular surface disease amongst glaucoma patients, uh, again, reaffirmed in many studies. How many studies? 720 articles in 35 years. So uh, again, it's uh, just a little bit disappointing to me that there's so much evidence and information in this. And yet sometimes some of the treatments that we would like to select for our patients, particularly some of the BAK free or preservative free medications that we'll be dis discussing this evening are not always well covered by our uh, patients formulary plans and prescription drug plans. So that's the really frustrating uh, side of things. And I think it has to do with, um, you know, a, a, a mixture of it, data and information. Uh, certainly not everyone is highly adversely impacted by glauc topical glaucoma medications. But, you know, with 60, 70% of patients having some signs and symptoms of the disease, it's hard to ignore it. And I wish that uh, our insurance plans and, um, uh, and other, you know, other uh, healthcare providers, healthcare uh, administrators would recognize that and, and help to serve our patients better with easier access to these products that we're going to be speaking of. So we know that BAK is, is uh, associated with toxicity to the ocular surface um, and that we can reduce that by using preservative free medications and treating their dry eye. And we're going to get into that in, in greater depth. Here's just another study looking at how uh, there's a spread. And, and again, I think the reason for confusion, maybe 50% of patients with uh, ocular surface disease fall into this group A 
uh, region, which is, you know, sort of the very mild, hardly noticeable, patients might be able to tolerate it fairly well uh, category. And then you get into higher score ranges where it's more moderate to severe stage of uh, ocular surface disease. And so it's not everyone. And by that time, perhaps the glaucoma is uh, more severe and more difficult for the patient to, um, uh, more important for the patient to address the glaucoma side of things and vision loss related to that uh, versus the ocular surface disease. Although I would argue both are always uh, very important. What other risk factors do we look at for those patients of ours who are being treated for glaucoma um, to develop ocular surface disease? Uh, the two th highlights on this slide here are uh, multiple medications, so three or more medications, not too common to have patients on four bottles of medication, but it, it can happen. Uh, but even patients with uh, uh, dual therapy, uh, bi-therapy, uh, have an increased uh, odds ratio risk for developing ocular surface disease. And then also if they have uh, concomitant ocular surface disease, uh, coexisting, pre-existing surface disease, that's gonna really increase the risk for developing OSD. So these are the patients that you wanna screen and identify as you may be treating their, uh, their glaucoma and their surface disease, or you may be in a scenario where the glaucoma patient is seeing someone else for their glaucoma treatment, and you're the one dealing with their ocular surface disease and dry eye. Um, so I think that this lecture can be really helpful for everyone to be aware of different treatment products and, and what the science is behind all of this and how, unfortunately, uh, many of our uh, ophthalmology uh, colleagues are not always paying great attention to the ocular surface and not always choosing uh, what I consider to be more optimal medications for our patients and uh, fully spending time discussing this and evaluating this for our patients. Uh, this is from the uh, uh, DUES, uh, TFOS DUES 2 uh, study. This is the iatrogenic report where they uh, looked at uh, causative agents in relationship to the development of ocular surface disease. Uh, so this is only you know, five years old now. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with it. Uh, in here, one of the call outs that I'm highlighting is that uh, patients uh, taking artificial tears are still often unfortunately taking uh, preservative containing artificial tear products. And that's just really something that we need to uh, be better aware of and really make recommendations and, and uh, treatment prescriptions for our patients to move away from uh, preservative containing artificial tear products. And again, that will have a great impact on our uh, patients with glaucoma disease. Uh, this um, a Venn diagram, if you will, shows the overlap of uh, really all of our clinical practices, I think. You know, some may have more dry eye patients. Uh, I have more glaucoma patients. We're always dealing with our patient's quality of life. And it's the intersection of all of these where we have to uh, get on our detective hats, get on our, um, you know, uh, listen to the patient's uh, hats and, and uh, do the right diagnostic testing and identify what treatment, op treatment options are best for our patients because it's really having a great impact on our patients' quality of life. Uh, we should be the ones taking the charge as, uh, as eye care practitioners in solving our patients' pro pro visual problems related to their quality of life. And when you combine dry eye and glaucoma, it just obviously exacerbates things and uh, makes it much more difficult for the patient. And again, I think just a great opportunity for everybody in, in clinical practice, even if you're not heavy into the glaucoma side of things. Uh, more articles here just reaffirming that this quality of life and, and using a number of different survey instruments to identify that uh, patients with ocular surface disease and glaucoma have a lower quality of life. It's associated with uh, higher exposure to the preservative BAK, um, but it's well documented, uh, again, going back uh, 10 years or more in American Journal of Ophthalmology. Uh, this is uh, another uh, survey uh, called the QOL, uh, I'm sorry, the GQL uh, Quality of Life 15, which is a 15 item questionnaire. Uh, patients evaluate their ability to perform visually demanding tasks every day. And the difference there highlighted on the right uh, shows patients without surface disease versus those with surface disease. In again, this is in glaucoma patients. So the survey instrument uh, was used very specifically. And again, it's reiterating things that we uh, know, but uh, I use this to 
you know, help reassure or reaffirm when I get questions about why I'm requesting a preservative-free medication or I need a prior authorization or, you know, some medical director somewhere wants to know why I'm doing something uh, particular for a patient. There are, these articles are, are widely available um, and well-cited in, in the literature. Again, more articles here on quality of life and um, the identification that using fixed combinations. Um, so when we take two glaucoma medications, put it in a single bottle, such as Combigan or Cosopt, uh, we're reducing the number of drops, we're reducing the amount of benzoclonium chloride uh, to the patient, and that actually has a, a very positive impact to reduce the uh, sensitivity, uh, reduce the toxicity to the cornea. And going even further than that would be to try to use BAK free or preservative free formulations. And that will help to improve our patient's quality of life. Uh, this next study looked at uh, almost 800 patients and um, uh, you know, a little bit scary to me sometimes is the reasons for patients' dissatisfaction with glaucoma treatments. I was like, wow, uh, you know, I'm not sure I want to find out what their, uh, what their main concern is. The good news from this uh, large study, and this is the survey that they use to identify what about glaucoma treatment glaucoma patients didn't like. Um, and I think that's valuable information for every practitioner. Don't get me wrong. Uh, the positive thing is that in this study, nine, almost 94% of the patients said they were satisfied or very satisfied with their treatments in terms of tolerability. Uh, you know, I think that's extremely high. I don't know that, you know, I have 94% of my patients being really happy about their treatment, taking eye drops every day or multiple eye drops. Uh, and so there was a relatively low dissatisfaction in the survey. I guess that's, again, good for my practice, but uh, I am concerned whether or not that's really uh, real or not. But the, sur the survey did identify a high frequency of conjunctival hyperemia, OSD, conjunctival staining, staining, all those things that we expect to see there. And so, again, it just reiterates that we do need to be careful about the treatment that we are putting on our patients and whether or not that's having um, a deleterious uh, side effect, whether it's causing intolerance, and whether that is ultimately impacting compliance. And so going back to 2006, some of the first studies came out to identify that uh, intolerance uh, or poor tolerance to glaucoma medication on the ocular surface is created by treatment, and that's then related to compliance. Now, the whole science of compliance is a whole nother hour lecture in and of itself. And I do have to admit that, you know, the, the direct tie between ocular surface disease and poor compliance is not perfectly uh, well elucidated in the, in the clinical research literature. Uh, this is one of the studies that was done on a VA-based, uh, veterans-based uh, population, identifying that um, uh, ocular surface disease, PTSD, and anxiety were some of the major associations with decreased compliance. So dry eye symptoms made it in there. Other things obviously are um, a factor in the very uh, large uh, and important issue of compliance and adherence. So um, unfortunately, there's not really stronger medications to say, well, I'm treating your dry eye and you're gonna definitely take your glaucoma medication every day. There's not really a strong link there. So we do have to be aware of that. Perhaps we can get better studies in the future. Um, so again, this goes back to the uh, ocular surface article and uh, some of the commentary and editorial identifying that, you know, uh, 10 years ago where, you know, the, uh, the KOLs and, and the researchers and the editors are shouting out that we really have to watch out the, for the preservatives that we're using in our uh, medications and, uh, and OTC agents that are dosed chronically. And we have to really be uh, aware of that and, and be smarter and more selective. Um, so, that you know, leads us to what are we using for preservatives in our eye drops? Well, we've mentioned uh, BAK, but we're going to talk more about that and uh, how that uh, uh, dissolves the cell walls and membranes as a real toxic agent. 
Uh, there are other uh, preservatives that are available. Polyquad is one. Uh, the third one on the list is uh, Purite, which we find in Alpha Gam P. That you know that came out in the late '90s. So uh, you know, moving away from BAK is not a new idea. It just doesn't have full traction, uh, at least in the United States, across all of our product uh, glaucoma product categories. Um, that's a the sodium uh, perobate is in a Gentile product. Uh, and then on the bottom is, is Sofzia, which was in Travitan Z branded product uh, that came out in the, uh, in the 2000s uh, after the initial introduction of Travitan. So that's what's uh, commonly used. If we take a more closer look at uh, BAK containing uh, glaucoma medications, it's almost 70% of all of our glaucoma medications. And this is a, a great list uh, from Optometry Times, uh, written by Vin Dang and uh, Ranji Bajwa. So uh, I thought this was a, a great um, a summary page. You can look over on the right-hand side here to see the exact concentration of BAK. And, and the guideline that I would you know, call out here is that the lower the BAK that you can find in a product that's gonna work for your patient, uh, that's where you want to do because that's where you want to go. If you can't eliminate it completely, well, you may be able to do that. And we'll talk about some of these products down here in a little bit. That's great. But uh, do everything that you can to at least reduce the BAK load to your patients. That's going to help uh, protect the health and integrity of the corneal epithelium. So BAK, uh, as we said, is a common preservative. It's not really an allergy. It's really just a toxicity um, because it's a quaternary ammonium compound. Um, it's a surfactant property like a detergent. It's breaking up those cell walls. And just, uh, and I'll show you some pictures coming up in a little bit, um, how it really just irritates and um, uh, stipples and opens up, uh, breaks down the, the, the corneal surface. That is used to an advantage by some glaucoma medications because it can increase the penetration through the cornea uh, and transmission across the cornea into the anterior chamber for glaucoma medication. So of course the glaucoma medication has to you know, be broken down somewhat. Sometimes there are prodrugs and then uh, the medication has to pass through the cornea into the anterior chamber. And if the, medic if the surface of the cornea is irritated, Theoretically, for some medications that may help the uh, penetration and therefore the efficacy and IOP lowering. Uh, but in quick summary, BAK's negative in, in, uh, impact on the ocular surface is epithelial barrier is compromised. There's very uh, there's impairment to the healing. Uh, there's increased in uh, conjunctival inflammatory cells. We lose goblet cells. There's a reduction in tear function. It uh, decreases the uh, tear breakup time. All of these negative things are, are found in, in a multitude of papers. Uh, and the mechanisms for that go a little bit beyond uh, what I've mentioned thus far. Um, and unfortunately are still uh, not always 100% uh, identified in terms of uh, the exact mechanisms. Uh, certainly uh, in, in immunoinflammatory reactions and release of cytokines. So the inflammatory cascade is there. Apoptosis, which is a type of uh, cell suicide, cell death. Um, oxidative stress, uh, a number of interactions with lipid components. So these are all the negative things that BAK does. And yet we use it in such a large number of our glaucoma medications. Uh, in this study here done in 2007, uh, now this is in vitro, uh, looking at cytotoxicity. Uh, on the left side is the uh, uh, phosphate buffered saline solution, not having any, uh, real, any real effect on cytotoxicity. And then over here are uh, three BAK containing uh, products, uh, Travaprost with BAK, Latanoprost with BAK, and then BAK itself having a high degree of uh, cytotoxicity. And then here's Travitan Z. Again, this is a branded product uh, using the Sofia preservative. Uh, and we'll talk more about that later on, showing that it has uh, um, uh, better um, uh, cell retention and less cytotoxicity. Uh, the slide here is just uh, identifying that it's the concentration of BAK, the total loading dose of BAK on a daily basis that can lead to uh, dose-dependent cell death, 
um, apoptosis, and then uh, complete necrosis and loss of the cellular structure. So that's why we speak about trying to reduce the number of eye drops, trying to reduce the total amount of BEK, even if you can't get away from it entirely. Here's uh, some slides uh, from an article in Investigative Ophthalmology and Visual Science uh, published in 2001, um, related to the uh, development of the uh, Purite preservative uh, that was included in the Alphagan P product. And you're looking at uh, scanning electron uh, microscopes of rabbit corneal epithelium, highly magnified. On the left is the untreated corneal epithelium. Uh, in the middle is uh, rabbit ep uh, epithelium treated four times a day for seven days uh, with purite. So hardly any change in the cellular structure there. And then uh, I'm not quite sure, I don't recall what the concentration of BEK was. I think it was a, uh, the typical 0 0.02 uh, concentration that is used in a lot of our ophthalmic preparations, dosed four times a day. So if you were taking a, a glaucoma medication four times a day, fortunately we don't have any other, no longer have four times a day dosing glaucoma medications, but the, as you can see, uh, the cellular structure, the uh, breakdown of the cell walls, um, and everything else there is just sort of disastrous to the corneal epithelium. So just think that uh, that picture is uh, worth uh, quite a bit. And then here's some other um, less highly detailed, uh, both diagrams and photographs uh, showing the normal mucin epithelial coating on the corneal surface. And then after uh, some amount of BAK uh, for 15 minutes, disruption to the epithelial coating, and again, just sort of breaking down the surface barrier, um, leading to dry eye irritation and all of its uh, signs and symptoms. So uh, just further work there uh, reestablishing this. And then uh, just another uh, 2019 Journal of Glaucoma article looking at uh, conjunctival goblet cells and glaucoma medications. Uh, so just, you know, it doesn't get any better. It just, uh, if you're putting uh, glaucoma medications on the ocular surface, uh, many of our patients and always, you know, the ones who may have the more advanced glaucoma or the more sensitive patients that we see in our practices, we are the ones who are listening to these patients. And uh, we really need to understand that all of this is, is not helping them per se. And we need to be able to step in with some treatment options. And we're going to get to that very shortly. So there's a, a summary of the uh, uh, implications for glaucoma therapy related to BAK and how it uh, promotes, uh, how it unfortunately promotes the development of dry eye and ocular surface disease. There are alternatives and we're gonna get to those. Uh, let's first uh, take a look at um, our common medications. And I just wanna highlight again, uh, products that we use every day in the treatment of glaucoma. So generic latanoprost uh, has the same amount of BAK in it that the branded Zalatan did. It's 0.02%. Uh, Bimatoprost 0.01%. That's the uh, newer version, you know, 10 years new, uh, at least of a lower concentration of bimatoprost has a higher concentration of BAK. So they actually had to raise it from the original dosing of uh, bimatoprost. The original dosing of bimatoprost original formulation, I should say, was 0.03%, so about three times higher than what we use today. It had a lower concentration of BAK, but when they, when they wanted to get rid of the hyperemia, so hyperemia in prostaglandin uh, analog dosed patients is not due to the BAK typically, it's primarily due to the prostaglandin analog. It's the, that part is the therapeutic agent. The ocular surface disease and the dry eye symptoms, that's due to the BAK. That's the toxicity on the cornea. But the conjunctival hyperemia, now, of course, there could be some from the BAK, but most of that is from your prostaglandin analog of the therapeutic agent causing some vascular dilation. So uh, bimatoprost with lower uh, concentration in the bottle has lower um, hyperemia. And then latanoprostine bunode, this is Visalta, uh, which is a, uh, a new enhancement of uh, latanoprost that includes a nitric oxide component to it and has the same amount of BAK. Here are other uh, glaucoma medications that contain BAK in the concentrations there. So again, if you're you know, forced into a uh, not able to get a preservative-free uh, option, you can 
go to these tables here or other tables that I've shown you and try to select those with lower BAK, over time, your patient should do better. And, I, and we'll, uh, we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, yeah, reducing total BAK load can improve and minimize ocular surface disease signs and symptoms. So how can you help your patient now? You may be managing glaucoma patients, you may be co-managing glaucoma patients, you may be somewhere in between on all of that. Uh, what I'm gonna start with is the uh, preservative-free formulations. Um, again, they may be familiar to you, uh, at least some of them may be, but perhaps not all of them. And uh, I'll give you, a, you know, an overview of the landscape. I'm not here to talk about any one particular product. I'm not trying to sell anything. Uh, I'm trying to use both generic and the branded names when appropriate uh, so that you can be aware of uh, seeking out products that are going to help your patients overall. So four options for preservative-free. Timolol, dorzolamide timolol, fixed-dose combination, Tafluprost and Latanoprost, at least in Canada at this point in time. Um, uh, oh, uh, this study is just, uh, I thought, a good uh, bar graph showing glaucoma medications causing epithelial cell membrane damage. And you can just sort of, you know, put this on a comparative score. Here is basically balanced saline, not causing any problems. Here's BAK 0.02%. Here's a lower concentration of BAK. He's an, here's an even lower concentration of BAK, having you know, less effect on uh, the cellular membranes. Here's latanoprost, 0.02%. And then here's some other agents that we're going to talk about. Travaprost uh, with BAK. So that's the original formulation, not Travitan Z. Here is um, the original bimatoprost, 0.03, with low BAK, but a lot of hyperemia. And then here is this other product, Tafluprost, that's been around for a while and unfortunately not very widely uh, utilized. Uh, moving on, uh, Timolol preservative free is uh, long uh, for a long time available um, and probably one of the original and I'm pretty sure the initial preservative free glaucoma medication. Um, and so it is often a go-to medication in, uh, in cornea services, cornea departments, uh, ophthalmology departments, uh, because it's well known in these uh, secondary and tertiary care environments. And you know, hopefully it can be now more well known to us. It is, uh, a, can be a costly medication. I did some research and found that uh, Bausch & Lohm that is now um, the supplier of the medication does have a patient assistance program. And so you might search that out. I don't know the details of it. Um, you know, I'm always being an investigator trying to find the best medication for my patient at the best cost possible. And, you know, I find that that's really necessary for these patients who really need to get away from BAK. So Timolol preservative free. There's publications on this supporting its efficacy and its uh, ability to still maintain good IOP control and also improve the ocular surface and comfort of the patient. And I think postulating a little bit that improved comfort and improved ocular surface will improve compliance. Hopefully those two things go hand in hand, but uh, we can't always be assured of that. Uh, another great product that is a mainstay in my practice is Dorzolamide Timolol Preservative Free. This is the fixed dose combination version of it. Uh, again, it's been available for many years. Uh, and still available so if you uh, seek it out. Um, this, of course, uh, includes is a D BID dosing. It's dorzolamide, the carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, timolol, the beta blocker. Uh, it's unit dose vials, and uh, it's preservative free. And it really can um, be a, a great chronic medication for patients. And I find greater formulary access to this one than some of the others. So. Um, you can look at that. You may also be able to find some uh, patient assistance programs. Again, as I said earlier, unfortunately, not all preservative-free medications are uh, easily attainable or affordable to our patients uh, on some of the um, more you know, budget line um, Medicaid plans and, uh, and commercial plans and Medicare plans. So um, doing a lot of prior authorizations and requests and uh, trying to find the best price for my patients. Uh, timolol, dorzolamide timolol preservative free, well documented in the literature that it's effective and uh, well tolerated by the corneal surface. 
Uh, Tafluprost, uh, under the brand name of Zyoptin, has also been around, uh, uh, particularly internationally, for, uh, for 20 years or so. Uh, this is a unit dose vial uh, delivered medication of a prostaglandin analog. Um, no preservatives, so that's great. Uh, has similar efficacy to latanoprost has all the typical PGA side effects. So you're not getting away from any of those things, but you are delivering to your patient uh, a preservative free medication. And uh, I've used this a lot and, and found a lot of good success with it. My patients often have to stay on a PGA because of its efficacy and convenience and once a day dosing. But when they have bad surface disease, I wanna get them off uh, BAK preservative entirely. Uh, studies here have uh, reaffirm switching from latanoprost to preservative-free tafluprost, um, you know, maintaining IOP control, uh, basically the same efficacy between tafluprost and latanoprost. So again, uh, I wish it was more widely available. I wish it would be a, a first-line option because I think that's where we should be today in, in 2022 for our patients. And again, I'm just pointing out that these are, these are not fly-by-night things. They've been well-studied and documented in the literature, including here, tafloprost decreasing tear osmolarity after being switched from latanoprost. And finally, in the PGA category is latanoprost preservative-free. Um, not, not really available, I think, unless you go to um, some of the... Um, uh, on-demand uh, Imprimis type of, uh, of formulary medications where it's, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the, on the term there, um, but not commercially available, uh, widely commercially available in the United States. Uh, but this is latanoprost PF and some studies looking at that, again, identifying that it's very efficacious at reducing intraocular pressure, but well tolerated. Um, I did some research for our Canadian friends if they're on uh, tonight, and monoprost, I believe, is the uh, agent that's available in Canada. Uh, again, same PGA side effects, a unit dose vial, and uh, is preservative-free. Again, I don't know about the logistics of getting that uh, for your patients in Canada. Uh, now, there is still new research going on. And, you know, uh, again, lots of interest uh, on industry. Uh, to try and get us these products and, and have more tools for us to help our patients who have ocular surface disease and glaucoma. Um, this is uh, from clinicaltrials.gov where they uh, monitor and uh, list all of the ongoing clinical trials. It's from a, a company called Tear Care, and they started a clinical trial with a uh, new ophthalmic solution that uh, I believe is latanoprost in a multi-dose vial that uh, has a proprietary agent that will remove the BAK um, upon dosing. So that's in clinical studies. And that may be, again, perhaps a more convenient way of, of delivering this. Because when we talk about these unit dose vial products like Zyoptin, um, that you know, is a hurdle for some patients. It can be confusing. The packaging is expensive. Um, you know, it can be a little bit wasteful sometimes. You may have a uh, product left over in the vial and you hate to waste it. Um, so there are some issues with unit dose vials. So some of the companies and in industry are looking for multi-dose vials. And again, uh, uh, just surfing the internet, I found something in Canada looking at bimatoprost uh, potentially being developed or has been submitted to Health Canada for bimatoprost in a multi-dose file. So maybe that's the wave of the future. And, and we've seen that this trend of preservative-free multi-dose files in our uh, over-the-counter uh, artificial tear products, which we're coming up to. Um, I would be remiss to say that, you know, when medications don't work or any topical medications, we know that we can do laser treatment. We can do bimatoprost sustained release, which is an intercameral injection of bimatoprost into the injury chamber that can last up to uh, one year. Um, this is the Durista product. Uh, so you may need to get away from medications entirely, give your patient a medication holiday. Uh, so SLT and uh, Durista could be employed there. Another approach is to use um, different dosing uh, devices to deliver your, the glaucoma medication to the patient. This is a product in development, a device, I should say, in development uh, from a company called Inovia. Um, not yet available. Uh, they are developing other products uh, first. 
uh, but they have uh, published a study on latanoprost with this uh, microdose um, uh, technology. You hold it up to your eye, you push the button, it's, it uh, uh, releases a very small 0.4 milligrams dose of latanoprost to the eye. More than enough to lower intraocular pressure and a lot less in terms of total toxicity and ocular side effects to the eye. So uh, potentially that may be something that we have in the future uh, from that company. Another way is uh, to reduce uh, drop volume is, oh, and this is, sorry, this is the data from Inovia in what they're doing with uh, the reduced drop volume. Uh, but another product uh, device that's out there is something called NanoDropper. Um, I've not actually used this yet. I've heard a lot about it. Uh, again, the idea is to reduce the total amount of eye drop that's going onto the ocular surface. And, you know, the argument is, is that you're reducing the amount of, um, you're, you're delivering enough therapeutic agent, but less so on the um, uh, toxicity side from BAK and things like that. Now, just a couple more glaucoma medications here before we take a look at some of the artificial tear formulations that I think go hand in hand with the uh, glaucoma treatment. Uh, these are BAK free, so not preservative free, but BAK free formulations. Sometimes these are a little bit more widely available to patients, uh, perhaps a little bit more affordable. Uh, we've mentioned uh, bromonidine with Purite. This is uh, only available in the branded product of Alpha Gam P. You may find bromonidine much more widely available as a generic, often with uh, benzoclonium chloride and sometimes with polyquat. But um, you know, try to stay away if you need to from the 0.2% bromonidine with BAK, and uh, you know, when possible, uh, advocate for uh, the branded product. Again, Travitan Z uh, is still available, uh, but there's also a, a mixture of uh, generic versions available these days. So you're sometimes never really sure where you, what you're getting from the pharmacy when you write for Travaprost. Uh, the original one used uh, the preservative of a combination of borate, sorbitol, and zinc uh, that was uh, branded as Safzia uh, by Alcon. But I think that uh, is somewhat available generically today. And here's some of the data showing that, you know, without BAK, this glaucoma medication did just great and it helped out our patient a lot. Uh, and finally, uh, there is latanoprost with potassium sorbate. So it is a non-BAK preserved latanoprost. Uh, it, the branded na brand name for this is Zelpros by Sun Pharma. Uh, again, it's, it's not traditionally part of all formularies. Uh, you often have to write just to a, not often, you only have to, you can only write for a uh, particular um, pharmacy uh, to get this product. And it's more of a cash pay basis model uh, for your patients on this product, but it is very affordable. And I've had a, a number of patients do quite well with, uh, with this product when they have real BAK uh, toxicity problems. And here's some of the data uh, looking at uh, BAK free latanoprost. Um, both in terms of efficacy of uh, OSDI scores and uh, improvement in uh, tear breakup time. Does it really help overall? Uh, again, just a number of studies reaffirming that the more you get away from BAK, whether it's um, BAK free or preservative free, everything else in the cornea seems to improve with time. So there's a, a summary of what we have in the glaucoma realm to make the first impact with our patients with glaucoma and coexisting ocular surface disease. Of course, we have to also offer uh, some treatment to their uh, dry eye and ocular surface disease. It was not my point in this evening's lecture to get into a, a full comprehensive treatment of, uh, of dry eye that's been done uh, very well on, on many of the other programs in this series. Uh, but I thought I would end here with just a, a, a quick overview of um, newer and new and commonly recommended artificial tear products, um, because these are often done in, at least in the first step of uh, identifying patients, uh, in, sorry, in uh, treating patients who have identified ocular surface disease and glaucoma. Uh, we want to have three goals. You know, we certainly want to avoid generic artificial tears. Any artificial tear with preservatives, we know that. 
So we need to have preservative free artificial tears. And we want to be careful about hindering or um, impacting the glaucoma medication use. So we don't want to dose use at exactly the same time. We want to tell our patients to wait at least 15 minutes in between drops. Uh, and certainly we want to get more aggressive if necessary, and typically it is, in terms of treating their ocular surface disease. So I don't mean to say here, to stay, to say here that um, we're just treating dry eye with artificial tears. That's probably the worst thing you can do. But, you know, they are a great supplement to um, our dry eye therapy overall. Uh, one of the new ones that I've become familiar with is Iviza. Um, this is, uh, I've, I've done the uh, reading here in the science. There's a, a, number of pa uh, a number of papers that have been published. Um, to, for full disclosure, Thea is a sponsor for this evening's program, though I do not have any um, contracted work with them or anything like that. So uh, I have nothing to disclose there. Uh, I've looked at the product, like I said, I, I, I'm anxious to start using it on my patients. The active ingredient is povidone, but it also has this natural ingredient, uh, triholose, that is a disaccharide, disaccharide uh, that offers a lot of ocular uh, bioprotection, osmoprotection, rehydration, rehydration of the cornea. It uh, is derived from the Rose of Jericho, um, a plant that survives a lot of dehydration and dryness, and then um, uh, will bounce back quite a, bit, quite a bit after it's being rehydrated. So uh, the Iviza family, um, again, if you want to, there will be a uh, further information from, the, uh, um, uh, from Thea at the end of this program that you may want to listen to. And here's, a, again, like I said, I go to the science. I, I pull the papers, I read the articles, um, I use it in my own hands. I'm not here to sell it. I'm just here to make you aware of it and say, you know, there's a lot of good products out there. Uh, let's look at products like this uh, Trihalos uh, hyaluronic eye drops um, that can decrease inflammatory markers in our patients with dry eye. And if they happen to have glaucoma in dry eye, all the better. So good science there. And um, I, I think I, I look forward to having uh, greater availability of, of those products from Thea. Um, of course, Alcon OTC products, sustained, complete, preservative-free is sort of the new one now. Um, I've used that a bunch already. Um, it's to me, it's it's you know preservative-free, and it's about you know getting the right vial um, so that it's multi-dose. It's easier, easy for my elderly patients with arthritis and other um, ailments to instill in their eye. Um, it's not a unit dose vial, which I like. Um, but it's multi-dose bottle, preservative-free. Um, it, it's been you know, well-received by my patients thus far. Of course, Alcon has a whole host of other dry eyes. I'm not getting into all of that. You know, If you need heavy-duty stuff, uh, sustain uh, preservative-free ointment at night. Um, you know, all of these are, are well-known uh, artificial tears. I use a lot of refresh products from uh, Allergan. They also have uh, multi-dose vial, uh, preservative-free. Um, very comfortable for my patients, long lasting. Uh, again, you can look into the science here, look into the active ingredients, uh, find out which one seems to work best in your patients. Um, all of them really are quite good. Bausch & Lohm uh, with their smooth line of products, both preservative free, night, nighttime ointment. And uh, finally, Fresh Coat uh, has been around for a while is now um, being marketed, distributed, owned, I'm not quite sure what the right term is, by Santin, uh, and formerly it was uh, from iVance. And I know that that's a popular product to, uh, to utilize in patients with, um, with dry eye. So in, in summary here, as we wrap things up, um, it really takes a whole host of uh, things to help our patients with ocular surface disease and glaucoma. Um, it's of course, not just uh, artificial tears, or, nor just reducing or eliminating BAK from our glaucoma medications. You have to think of all the other things that are in the clinical arsenal for treating ocular surface disease and dry eye. Um, I think that it's a lot of patient education, uh, making sure they understand the overlap between these two conditions. And that's why I often like to separate uh, into two separate visits. And I know it's difficult for patients to come back and not everyone can do that for multiple visits, but 
uh, if I'm doing dry eye, and, and quite honestly, in, in my institution, more often than I'm just starting with the dry eye, and then they're going to a dry eye specialist within my uh, institution, that's where they're going to get the full amount of time, all the right testing, uh, a full discussion of the treatment options. Um, I might have reduced the BAK with my glaucoma medications. I might have started them on a preservative-free artificial tear, but then when, they, when it needs to go beyond that, um, I call in the real experts there. And I, I want my patient to understand that and a separate visit usually connotates that, like you're not here for glaucoma today, it's just the dryness, or you're only here for glaucoma today, you're gonna go see Dr. X to, to take care of the dryness. Um, and however you can do that in your practice, I think makes a lot of sense. Um, so perhaps a question you've been asking is like, well, you know, when am I gonna see improvement? Uh, this is one of the few articles that really followed patients who were treated for over six months uh, there was no change in their glaucoma medications, but they employed a comprehensive treatment for ocular surface disease. And within one to three months, they found statistically significant improvements in uh, best corrected visual acuity, OSDI, uh, bulbar conjunctiva redness, fluorescein staining, you know, all of these things. Um, they interestingly found a uh, greater reduction in IOP, not the eight millimeters that I showed you from that study earlier, but I think what is more clinically um, um, expected, which is, you know, one to maybe two, one and a half millimeters of IOP lowering uh, from baseline. Again, no glaucoma medications uh, were changed, um, but it, it reaffirms that this intervention uh, can have an impact uh, on our patients and all the more reason why we need to do it. So in summary, uh, do, preservative, uh, do preserved glaucoma medications have a deleterious effect on superficial eye tissues? We all know the answer is yes. BAK is bad. Um, dose and time dependent, yes. So decrease the concentration, decrease the dosing. Can we reverse and treat this? Yes. Is it clinically important? Absolutely. Um, especially in our patients with uh, uh, pre-existing ocular surface disease that's going to be exacerbated by our topical glaucoma medications. Um, this is the uh, OSD algorithm from the uh, Association of uh, and Society of uh, Cataract and Refractive Surgeons. It's a highly complex diagram. I'm not pretending to go through it here, but, you know, do all of our patients uh, with glaucoma deserve a, a complete OSD uh, evaluation? I believe so. It's gonna keep our patients happy. It's gonna keep our practices busy. Um, it's gonna be good for everyone. And uh, as a final comment, uh, this is a uh, editorial comment from uh, Mark Abelson in, in Boston uh, over 10 years ago that uh, protecting the integrity of the ocular surface while treating ocular conditions such as glaucoma is undoubtedly the wave of the future. Well, uh, I say to everyone, let's go back to the future and let's take care of our patients with dry eye and glaucoma. Thank you.